Hello, I'm Richard Kaufman. I'm chair of NYSERDA. I'd like to welcome everybody for participating in this webinar on non-wire solutions. We have a great panel of experts that will now introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. My name is Jason Prince from Rocky Mountain Institute. Looking forward to speaking with you all. Uh, my name is Daniel Munoz Alvarez. I'm with uh, Wood Mackenzie Power and Renewables, uh, formerly part of uh, GTN Research. I'm excited to talk here with all of you. Hi, this is Brenda Chu with the Smart Electric Power Alliance. Uh, excited to talk about our recent study in partnership with E for the Future and PLMA on non wires alternatives. Hi, everyone. This is Mihir Desu with Stratagen. Um, excited to talk about some of the work that, that we've done with NWS. So here's the agenda. Why should we care about NWS, the drivers of the market, challenges, recommendations for scaling? And then we'll have a chance for uh, answer questions at the end. So there's a chat box. So please enter your questions. And please address the speaker you'd like to address your question uh, and uh, throughout, the, throughout the presentation. Uh, next, next slide, please. Thank you. So there are a lot of acronyms. There's NWS, uh, which stands for non-wire solutions. There's NWA, which stands for non-wire alternatives. There's NTA, which stands for non-transmission alternatives. There's even something more recently called an NPA, which is a non-pipe alternatives for gas uh, distribution utilities. And they all mean the same thing, which is using DER and other innovative energy solutions in place of traditional utility infrastructure. And by the way, a little bit of history in New York State, while we use NWS as our, as our acronym, we actually started with NWA, but we changed that because NWA is a hip hop group, uh, most famously known for straight out of Compton. Uh, so what NWS also means is it also involves a, a change in process, both from regulators and utilities uh, to open up the capital planning model to engage with third party DER market participants and also to changes in utility compensation. So I'd like to put uh, I'd like to put uh, NWS in context. Uh, because it was the first step in reforming the energy vision in New York State, and which began six years ago. Because at that time, we knew that current trends in the electricity sector couldn't be sustained. Uh, the first issue that we have had that exists around many places in the country are rising costs for electricity. So even though fracking has reduced the cost of generation, transmission and distribution costs continue to increase. So the customer bills continue to increase at the same time while the cost of distributed solutions continue to decline. We already had a million New Yorkers having difficulty paying their electricity bills. And these trends of higher central station production and distribution costs against declining DER costs meant uh, increasing challenges for the future of the utilities as well as inequity in the system as those customers that could f afford their own der solutions could go their own way leaving the cost of the distribution system spread over fewer and fewer customers after sandy we also realized that the system needed greater resilience the system is very resilient until it's not and then it's not resilient at all and then we also recognized that we were not moving quickly enough to reduce emissions. So Rev addressed really the fundamental issue underlying all these problems, which is that we've been trying to bolt on DER and renewables onto a 100-year-old grid architecture and regulatory regime never designed for this purpose. And the architecture, which is, of course, the architecture of Tesla and Westinghouse, is a central station one-way flow system where production is based upon fixed demand. So Rev's objective has been to build the grid of the future, which is the picture we've always seen, a mix of central station and distributed resources. 
the ability to use demand side resources to balance intermittency, uh, two way flows, and with dynamic supply and demand. And Rev uh, recognizes that the, only by building this new grid can we achieve the climate resilience and cost issues that we must achieve. So NWS was a way for us to begin this process. We know that DER benefits the host. The question is always where to deploy to benefit all customers. You know, and in an ideal world, we'd have a, a process for determining locational value, where to put DER on the grid, but we didn't have that six years ago. But we knew that areas of grid constraint were often areas where DER uh, would benefit the system as a whole, and therefore all customers would benefit. And NWS was also a way to get utilities, regulators, and DER providers started in a process of change with little or no regret. So by definition, we would be deploying more DER at a cost less than conventional utility infrastructure. So it started with Con Ed, thanks to them on, in Brooklyn and Queens, it was a very large NWS. Con Ed was gonna spend a billion two on new substations. And instead by asking uh, markets for alternatives, what came back from, mark, from the market was instead of $1.2 billion in traditional infrastructure, was $200 million of alternatives, CHP, storage, solar, uh, energy efficiency, demand response, uh, and so it saved all customers a lot of money and deployed uh, innovative solutions and is cleaner. Since then, every utility in the state has adopted NWS in capital planning, and there are dozens uh, NWS is a big prize. Uh, we will deploy much more DER. Uh, we will save customers a lot of money, as you can see, $17 billion on this slide, and significantly reduce emissions. Plus, these other benefits, improving grid resilience, building out the grid edge, creating economic uh, opportunity by drawing in more innovators, and again, and this is really important, a no-regret way to move regulators, utilities, stakeholders to policies and processes that will accelerate new utility business models that together uh, will help build the grid of the future. Next, next slide. Thank you. Um, so Dan, let's let's turn to you. Uh, so. Uh, we think NWS is, uh, is a, our big prize. So can you give us some more history? Where are we in national deployment? Uh, right, so Richard, you kind of laid out uh, some of the main uh, components or drivers or barriers uh, that you know involved, are involved in non-wire solutions. And just to give a little bit of context at the national level, uh, that's the way I like to think about it. So if you think of, you know, NWA is having technical, administrative, economic, and business model barriers through history and since the 90s uh, in the U.S. We've been kind of uh, overcoming gradually these barriers. So, the, you know, initially in the 90s, um, we got like since then some sparse projects that effectively showed that it was possible through, especially in the past, through energy efficiency and particularly uh, geographically targeted energy efficiency that it was possible to defer infrastructure projects. Uh, then later uh, in uh, 2006, I think it, it was Vermont who initially uh, tried to tackle the, um, let's say the administrative uh, barrier through regulatory changes. And effectively they deployed a regulatory framework that mandated all the utilities in the state of Vermont to um, involve or to have in their planning process um, methodologies to consider for non-transmission alternatives. So initially they started with transmission projects only and eventually that became or expanded to distribution projects as well. So let's say that uh, effectively in Vermont uh, tackled the administrative barrier and um, created a, 
a process within the utility environment to consider for NWAs. And later, moving forward, um, as cost of DERs uh, became uh, lower and lower and they became more competitive, in particular against traditional infrastructure, uh, New York and California started in uh, 2013-14 with the DRP in California and with REV in New York, as you were uh, talking, Richard, um, they tackled the last of the barriers, which is in the regulatory environment, that uh, barrier to the business model of the, the traditional business model of the utility. So not only utilities are going to be mandated to consider NWS, but also encourage economically uh, to consider them because otherwise they'll be carving out part of the revenue and the return they were making traditionally. So we need to create a NWS as part of the new business model of the utilities if we want utilities to pursue them uh, in a cost-effective way. So that brings us now to that component, which is as more states incorporating their regulatory uh, framework, the ability for utilities not only to be mandated uh, to pursue these opportunities, but to get rewarded, to conduct them, then we will see uh, batches of new projects coming from different uh, states. Uh, that's what we've been seeing from New York, California, Vermont. It's been, you know, since 2016. Uh, 2006, but uh, not so much recently. And then Minnesota uh, and Nevada are the most recent ones joining uh, that list of states. Back to you, Richard. All right, thanks. So, so Brenda, SEPA has done a, a, a study on NWS uh, case, case studies ac across the country. So could you take us deeper into the forces that are driving interest in NWS, are they are these pull forces or or push forces? Sure, absolutely. If you actually go to the next slide, uh, that'll have some of our information. So I would say, kind of building upon what Daniel's talking about in terms of some of the regulatory processes and what you've mentioned in terms of New York Rev and how that was driving non-wires projects, there is that regulatory environment which looking at those 10 case studies, uh, that really did play a role for over half of them. Uh, but there also are a number of examples that exist today where the internal management decision was one of the larger driving forces and the regulatory environment and other mandates may have had more of a tang tangential influence. So I think of an example such as APS, they're, uh, they actually had a stakeholder proceeding back in 2016 where the Alcatillo modernization project uh, had them agree to make to put in about a 10 megawatt hour battery storage project somewhere uh, in their service territory. So they were already kind of tangentially looking to implement electric storage, but they hadn't figured out how. And when they were starting to analyze a 21 kV feeder level uh, thermal constraint that they had, uh, battery storage seemed to fit well in there. But there are other factors that influenced them. So one was trying to figure out how to test out battery storage. The other was that it actually was the least cost option. Uh, and so there are a number of these project specific uh, challenges and also the cost effectiveness that gets factored in that help to uh, let them choose that solution. And I would say that driving even more beyond the regulatory environment, how some of these projects came about, you often do also have very specific project and geographically constraining factors that help to influence it. Uh, in the case of Bonneville Power Administration, their original infrastructure upgrade that they were looking at was an 80 mile, 500 kV transmission line that A, would have cost about a billion dollars, and B, it was going to build through certain communities, it faced a lot of community opposition, and that also had them turn their heads to look at some other solutions. So that really could drive that movement. Uh, and another kind of example to build off of that is National Grid's Old Forge project, which is in its more earlier phases, their project, the transmission, they were looking at a 50 mile sub-transmission line that would have gone through a park and just trying to get through the permitting and construction challenges there, it really also pushes them to look at not necessarily building, but looking at some of these more flexible, innovative options. So I think that there are a lot of different factors at play that build upon that uh, beyond just the, manage the regulatory side, but I think that the environment definitely is moving across the US. 
so thank you. So Mahir, where where do you think we are uh, in the continuum uh, with utilities either embracing or resisting NWS? Uh, do, in your view, are they really interested in NWS, or and do they go ahead and and implement these projects? Thanks, Richard, for that question. So I I do think there's a natural disincentive for utilities um, to adopt NWS, similar to um, you know energy efficiency and, and the the disincentives with with that paradigm. So you know there's characteristic approaches and, and mandates can be more of a stick approach um, but I, I think there are ways to put carrots in front of the utilities um, there's been some talk around performance based rate making um, and which has been done on a ad hoc project by project basis across the country I, I do think we want to probably have a more sustainable framework in place so utilities can um, have incentives to adopt NWS on a larger planning horizon. And, and that's kind of where you start to implement these procedures within the planning and procurement processes. So um, some ways are from a regulatory framework uh, to start to implement uh, mandates to have utilities look at these on an apples to apples basis versus con conventional solutions. And, you know, uh, your team in New York, Richard, has, has done a good job of, of looking at this through the rev process and, and uh, creating some systemic approaches there. Um, in Australia, they've done some interesting work too, and the graph, graphic on the side is, is kind of their framework on looking at um, regulatory investment tests for distribution. So, I, I, and there's also, of course, a number of proceedings, as Daniel had mentioned earlier, across the U.S. All right, so so Dan, Daniel, do you agree that that uh, pursuing NWS is a prize worth pursuing? Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, yes. Um, so to to get a sense or a pulse into that question, um, we try to do with uh, my colleagues at Wood Mackenzie, we try to do a like a quick analysis of what was the the size or the potential size of this market. To see, you know, what would be the interest uh, in developers uh, across the country in this specific submarket, and uh, so what we tried to do was we took uh, Avangrid, uh, which is, you know, formerly uh, Iberdrola USA in New York, we took their capital um, investment plan for five years, uh, 2018 through 2022. And out of that capital project, which is a 2.5 billion dollar uh, capital plan for five years. Uh, you know, you have the different drivers or the projects are classified by the drivers and we applied, basically they applied in that report uh, the criteria that under REV was uh, agreed upon for that particular utility. So basically you have a, a suitability criteria for considering NWS for the different projects and there are three criteria in particular. The first one is um, the capital project has to be driven by a capacity need or by a reliability need. Uh, the second component is uh, the lead time of the project has to be uh, at least three years or more. And then the third criteria is uh, the expected project uh, transmission distribution infrastructure project has to be at least of one million to be worth exploring NWA solutions. So basically they kind of, out of that plan, by just first applying the first criteria, the driver of the project, you already um, screen out 73% uh, that will be considered for NWS. Out of that uh, is boiler pie that now you have, uh, you apply the other criteria and some uh, technical feasibility analysis and in the, in the same plan, uh, Avangrid concluded that it um, had uh, eventually uh, narrowed down to a 12% of that budget uh, of projects that would be able to be considered for NWA solutions. So this is not only, not even uh, solutions that are gonna be uh, deployed as NWS, but they're gonna go through a more detailed technical, uh, techno-economic analysis 
benefit cost analysis to determine whether it's worth uh, or cheaper to do an NWS. To extrapolating that exercise of 12% uh, of the budget of the capital investment plan to the largest utilities in the US uh, out of the FERC Form 1 um, uh, data that is available. You apply that to the 2016 uh, data on investments in TND uh, infrastructure and you get a number that is $5.4 billion that could be considered for deferral through NWS. So that's not, that's not exactly the value that will go into DERs because that's exactly the value that will be deferred, but it, it gives you a sense of what's the, the potential annual size of this market moving forward. All right, so $5.4 billion is certainly a big number, but we didn't deploy very much NWS against that number in 2016, so, so the question is why. So, Jason, what's your perspective on the obstacles that we face now to NWS to achieve NWS at scale? And maybe you can give some examples where NWS doesn't make sense. Yeah, thanks for the question. So there certainly are challenges we, we acknowledge at the nascent stage of the market. I think we've already discussed some of the regulatory issues in terms of the utility business model needing to be aligned and also some of the technical issues. So, you know, oftentimes we, we need to think about reliability. We need to think about data sharing concerns and subsequent cybersecurity issues, also cost effectiveness. So all of those challenges need to be solved. But I would argue that beyond those issues, there's another layer here, which is the fact that, you know, not all utility infrastructure investments are necessarily good candidates for non-wires. And this is in line with what Daniel was just describing in terms of the breakdown for avant-grid capital plan. And it's also why states like New York and elsewhere, including New Hampshire, New, um, Rhode Island, California, Vermont, have adopted similar suitability or screening criteria so that today we, we kind of pick the low-hanging fruit and set non-wires up for success by going down the path of procurement, really when you expect the solutions to be viable. So for example, a, a criteria is timing. The first row here, in all states we surveyed in our implementation playbook uh, had this as an issue. And so the idea was that projects slated for investment within a very short term of a couple months would not likely be suitable for non-wires because there's an appreciation that the procurement takes time and sometimes it's worth making a contingency time, which lengthens the process. So sometimes states would want to exclude projects that are in the immediate term from non-wires consideration. However, we have seen that it's very technology specific how long deployment takes. So sometimes a non-wire solution might actually be faster than a traditional solution. For example, if that traditional solution is extending distribution lines. Another category is the economic value, which is relatively straightforward. You know, you don't want to start considering non-wire solutions for investments that are only a few thousand dollars because there's transaction costs. So you really want to focus on these solutions when the potential avoided cost is large enough. Um, for project type, you know, not all investments are for things like reliability that non-wires can substitute for. Sometimes utilities invest in grid operations, whether it's telecommunications or, you know, some fault detection automation processes or sectionalizing equipment. So that might not make sense. Um, asset conditions, another category that's very related to that. It's just certain project types, like if it's an investment in replacing equipment because it's, uh, you know, not working very well, sometimes you still need to do that. And the last category is project size. So, you know, again, given the nascent of the market, utilities might only want to consider non-wire solutions for projects that are less than a certain size. So, for example, if you have, uh, you know, 50% of, of a peak load on a circuit needs to be addressed, an issue with a non-wire solution could be catastrophic. So, at this early stage of the market, by limiting the size of the project you're implementing a non-wires for could help you limit the downside. Um, what I would mention is that overall, Screen criteria are not meant to be set in stone, and they should really be applied as heuristics to guide kind of further investigation 
into non-wires as solutions to grid needs. And that criteria should be evolving over time. So these categories and then the, you know, the number of months and the size of the project should evolve as we learn how non-wires actually function once they've been deployed. Mihir, uh, the common worry about NWS is about reliability. So what's your perspective on this? Is it overstated? No, I, I think it's a, definitely a valid concern um, that a lot of utilities have. Um, so, you know, you, you had asked before about some examples of where NWS wouldn't be suitable solution um, for for a given need. And in, in a project that we looked at uh, with Puget Sound Energy, we're evaluating whether um, storage as a part of an, an M NWS could uh, meet the reliability need for a specific area in the east side of Seattle. And so as, in, in this graph here, uh, the blue line is like the early load um, of, of a peak day. And the red line is essentially the emergency operating limit. And you can see like the, the load goes over that emergency operating limit for a few hours. Um, as well as like the normal operating limits. And um, basically the duration of uh, the load going over these operating limits has created a reliability constraint that um, energy storage in, in particular um, was not cost effective in meeting. So I, I, I think, you know, it's definitely the first consideration to try to keep the lights on. and if uh, an NWS can't do that in a cost-effective manner, then um, you know conventional solutions are probably a, a better um, alternative. All right. So you've talked about uh, traditional solutions. So the, the nice thing about here, you, I'm going to keep coming back to you, but traditional utility infrastructure is pretty easy for utility and regulators to procure and evaluate the their cost benefit. So NWS involves often a portfolio of, of technologies, many of which are newer and much harder to source and evaluate. So it's more complicated. So how, how do you, how do you, what are your thoughts on how to deal with this complexity? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, a lot of, a lot of the DERs, uh, within a potential NWS um, provide value to the grid that isn't necessarily monetizable. Um, there may not be uh, a market product if you're in a deregulated market or if you're in a vertically integrated market, um, specific utilities uh, may not have the tools in place to effectively figure out what the avoided costs might be or um, or how to how to monetize like certain value streams that don't directly hit their revenue base. So I think the key here is to equip um, utilities as well as stakeholders with the tools needed for a more holistic evaluation. Because um, unless we're able to compare NWS with conventional solutions on a more apples to apples basis. Uh, we may not see the level of adoption that you know we're we're forecasting here. All right, Brent, I want to turn to you. Uh, what can the SEPA study teach us about obstacles? Sure, absolutely. I will say that when we first put out this call for project nominations, we were actually really hoping that some folks would nominate their projects that never kind of went through and why those projects kind of went through big pitfalls and weren't able to uh, succeed. But you can imagine people weren't really running at our doors to show us the, the failures, so to speak. Um, but across the 10 case studies that we have, we it has demonstrated a lot of success across existing projects. And there are still certain specific themes and uh, lessons learned that those earlier adopters of non-wires projects could share for the broader audience. Um, one of the first big things that we pulled out of these projects were that there really were a few 
projects that were very specifically focused uh, when they started that effort on trying to implement a specific program or technology. That was about three or four of the projects. And uh, for those efforts, when they kind of came in there with a, a preconceived notion in terms of how they wanted to approach their challenge, there was uh, higher levels of uh, challenges in terms of trying to meet their capacity reduction targets. Uh, so one of the lessons learned that was kind of were pulled out of that, which really Jason talks a lot more about in his um, in the RMI report, is having a more open and technology agnostic approach to trying to meet those challenges were really helpful and helped to yield um, new solution opportunities. Um, but also kind of what you're speaking about, Richard, and what Mahir is alluding to as well, um, there are some re reliability challenges. In the case of APS, they put in that storage project and they found that it was not a very straightforward comparison between the reliability profiles of a traditional wires upgrade and that of a battery storage project. So they were able to meet it, but it did require a lot of elbow grease and efforts to meet those internal reliability goals, having multiple layers of redundancy, backup plans, oversizing the battery, figuring out those operational limits. Uh, and for, for that element, it does require kind of a lot more internal development and planning for that, probably a lot more planning and time in terms of uh, developing your RFPs, RFOs, and doing procurement processes to figure out uh, what you want and giving people and those solution providers more time to develop commercially viable solutions. Um, another interesting finding was that, as Mahir is showing, you, you see these load forecast and you're trying to figure out how to meet those challenges that may arise in the next coming years. And so many of these projects were looked at because of that. Uh, but at least for three specific examples, those non-wires projects came about for in response to uh, forecasted load. And over time, it was actually seen that that load growth did not end up materializing. So it's interesting. It's, it's a challenge to have uh, a robust and accurate forecast that kind of leads to a, a different challenge in general. But uh, that also speaks to the strength of these projects too, because instead of investing in a large or expensive infrastructure upgrade or more permanent solution, you end up having this uh, opportunity to scale up and scale down some of these projects. And a lot more of the other kind of pitfalls and challenges that these projects had were often more specific to certain technologies or certain programs. So on the demand response side or energy efficiency side, it may have been challenges with recruitment and engaging those uh, customers or perhaps going in wanting to do a demand response program, but then after actually trying to recruit customers, realizing that there may not have been that much load to reduce. Uh, or when really trying to analyze and look at the cost for electric storage, uh, a broader challenge that we're still facing within the industry today is how can you really account for those the multiple value streams of a storage project? Uh, STEM's virtual power plant effort really was able to show how their software uh, was able to derive different value streams. But if you're looking at a project, if it's only for two years, uh, trying to figure out how to account for that is still something that we uh, as an industry are trying to figure out together. Great. All right, so so let's move on to the next part of the agenda, which is to recommendations for scaling. So Danny, I'm going to turn to you. Uh, can you discuss the key components that are needed to take NWS to scale? And let's talk about different means of procuring NWS. Uh, right, Richard. So we've talked about different things, but yeah, I think focusing on the, the sourcing channels, uh, as we've uh, come to mention them or describe them in the report we made back in uh, 2017. Uh, so when first talking to Marcus Guerra, who's the uh, director of planning at PG&E, uh, I like the way he described the different methods and that he mentioned the three Ps, uh, procurement, programs, and pricing. And I kind of, that idea resounded. And if you focus on the left uh, part uh, of the slide, I have those three different uh, sourcing methods or procurement methods, uh, where basically you have the first one, I'm going to refer to the last one, actually, is the, the pricing mechanism, 
which is kind of the aspirational dream of economists. We, we want to have locational pricing at the retail level that reflects all the value that DERs can bring at a particular time at a particular location in the distribution network. But then that approach, which is the ultimate one that we want to reach out eventually, uh, has many uh, technical, administrative, um, and regulatory and business model uh, challenges that we have to, in the midterm, we have to figure out how to uh, overcome them. In the meanwhile, and that's why this pricing strategy um, is not is necessary but not sufficient, uh, we have to also keep relying on customer programs and utilities have a lot of experience in these traditional uh, energy efficiency and demand response programs. The only difference being that for NWS, they have to be geo-targeted. So basically they focus on, on specific feeders, on specific substations and downstream of them, and they can do exactly what they know how to do. Uh, and then the other one, which is where we've seen more activity in the U.S. in particular, are the direct procurements. And those can be either competitive procurements, like you know the, the most known uh, RFPs, uh, where we've been seeing a lot of activity, in particular in New York and in California, but uh, also there are um, the auction, which uh, in BQDM in New York, uh, Con Edison try to do all the procurement methods at the same time in one project. And that auction showed to be an innovative way of um, procuring different sets of solutions for one particular uh, need of the grid. And then the one, the direct procurement, which is, uh, let's say, not competitive, uh, but also useful is the partnership. So also Ken Edison focused there on working together with the New York Housing Authority uh, because they have a lot of assets in the city and it was very efficient uh, and less time consuming to directly deal with the housing authority and come up with different energy efficiency and demand response solutions directly. So those are basically Hello? Richard, back, back to you. Okay, thank you, sorry. All right, so uh, Mahir, could you please give your thoughts on structuring procurement? Yeah, absolutely. So I think procurement is probably where the rubber meets the road here and um, effectively structuring what your procurement looks like takes, takes To uh, planning and procurement processes, but on the procurement side, you know, some simple things are: is is this solicitation being sent out to vendors that um, offer solutions that are beyond conventional? Like, are are they hitting um, the the right people at like the stems, the AMSs, and other companies out there? Um, and then the specific need of the the RFP. Um, is it is it expansive enough to not just consider like capacity or energy? Can it can it look um, holistic offering that you know in, in NWS would be more competitive in? Um, and and this comes to some of the integrated resource planning processes um, that are underway and, and being um, effectively. Uh, updated to incorporate some some of these criteria, and then in addition, like have existing uh, DR programs that maybe the utility offers, can they be combined with um, a vendor solution to provide uh, you know the reliability or other needs that uh, the procurement entity is, is looking for, and then once you have your your bids in place. Um, is the procurement entity, do they have the right uh, tools in place and, and software or modeling um, approaches to effectively value the different um, bids and, and alternatives on an apples to apples basis? And um, ha has this process been done in, in a way that, you know, stakeholders can understand? So I, I think a lot of Simple steps can go into uh, ensuring that these solicitations um, are open to a bunch of different offerings. 
Good. Uh, Jason, can we go back to this question about reliability and and could you address what needs to be put into contracts to be sure that reliability issues are addressed? Yeah, thanks, Richard. So when we developed our uh, implementation playbook, we thought long and hard about how you contract for non-wire solutions given the high stakes that they're really being placed on the grid and, and are going to be responsible for ensuring reliability. So we actually worked with a law firm, Wilson Sonsini, and we sought to identify what the key differences were between traditional utility contracts like a PPA or a GSPA or um, you know any of the different names, how those standard contracts were different. And, and we identified four key areas where the risk profile really ultimately as it relates to reliability came into play and they required adaptation of the standard contract language. So um, before I start, I'll, I'll walk through four categories where we think that the risk profiles are really different and, and you need to actually have some key contract language to ensure that non-wire solution is reliable and, and functions appropriately. But the, the first thing to consider is, it's kind of like Mihir was saying, who is the integrator? You know, who bears the risk? Is it the utility or is it a third party aggregator? Because that does make a difference, and oftentimes the utility could perhaps offload some risk onto that aggregator, um, contractually at least. But you know, one area that really matters for reliability is dispatchability. So if you have a non-wire solution, for example, that's comprised of energy storage or perhaps demand response, which are active technologies that need a dispatch to function the way that you need them to as a result of um, the non-wire solution, um, the integrator, you know, the utility wants to control that dispatch. They want to be able to say, okay, if I need you to work at this point, it's to make sure that our grid's going to keep functioning and you have to be available for me. Um, the utility also wants to see all the individual accounts. They want, you know, to be really able to understand what's going on. And they don't want those resources to be utilized by anyone else. However, on the flip side, the developer, you know, they want to control the dispatch themselves. And they don't really want to have to give the utility visibility into all those accounts. And, and most importantly, they want to be able to operate this asset outside of the non-wires requirements, however they'd like. So, you know, as a solution here, the mitigation strategies, it's like looking at the risks and then figuring out practical ways to mitigate them for both parties. The, the idea is that there should be an allowance for the non-wire solution to perform other services for the grid. However, there needs to be a hierarchy so that reliability is maintained and the developer can do what they want only outside of certain parameters that ensure it's going to be available for its primary function, which is the non-wire solution. Um, and also, utilities would have to pay more for that utilization and those rights. And speaking of payment, in terms of how the developer actually gets paid, you know, from their end, they'd like fixed payments so they know exactly what their revenue stream is going to be. However, from a utility side, they really only want to pay once that asset has performed. So it's a battle between fixed versus variable payments. And ultimately, you can do either or you can do a combination. The, the key here is that the non-wire solution developer has performance guarantees with credit support. So financially, they are going to uh, have their skin in the game to ensure that, yep, we're going to be there for you to provide that service that we're promising. And in addition, there's this idea for variable payments where the utility wants the developer to perform well, and they should pay them for that uh, performance. So for example, if it's an energy efficiency measure, um, there's probably a guaranteed amount of reductions below a baseline. But if the developer is able to extract more efficiency savings, then there should be an extra incentive for them so that they're aligned. And you know, speaking of performance, some of the key risks here is that the uh, developer doesn't want to have any worries about their uh, contract being terminated. But you know, the, the utility does. The utility says, hey, if you're not showing up on time, I need to be able to get rid of you so I could go do a traditional solution. Um, there's also concerns as it relates to maintenance, who's going to make sure that the systems are upkept, and also having just many different accounts. And so the idea here, uh, the mitigation strategies, is that 
for the, for the performance, you look at on a rolling basis. So you think through how the asset need to perform over time to make sure that the non-wire solution works. And you have flexibility in the portfolio so that you actually have diversification that, you know, through the rule of large numbers and, and multiple technologies ensures that the solution as a group, you know, comprised of many different components is able to meet the need of the grid. Um, and then the last thing as it relates to construction, you know, you do want to have milestones to ensure reliability that the solution is online when it needs to be to meet that grid need. And you want to have, um, you know, certifications or um, at least some third party engineer that provides a thumbs up, green night, everything is good. And so mitigation strategies to avoid those risks, you need to have penalties in your contract that if the facilities are delayed, there needs to be uh, liquidated damages and also termination rates at some point. So, you know, in sum, we, we do think that there are unique considerations to contract for non-wires to ensure reliable outcomes, but it's possible to do it. And, and a lot of contracts have already been inked to date that illustrate this point. Okay, so uh, Brenda, I think last question to you. I want to, you could go back to the SEEP report on what came out in terms of best practices from your case studies. Yeah, absolutely. So I did speak already to having that technology agnostic, more open approach to finding solutions. Uh, and there were some interesting examples that specifically looking at, for example, Con Edison, when they were looking at portfolio approach, there were also insights in terms of how you can build upon that portfolio and kind of time your resources to come in to be able to accommodate different types of technology, especially if they're newer. Um, so uh, there were some insights like, such as first implementing energy efficiency, you can kind of deploy that earlier, or existing pro programs, start to recruit demand response and build in time so that if you're looking at electric storage, you need to account for interconnection and siting and other uh, implementation uh, challenges that you kind of build that time in to be able to incorporate those solutions later on. Uh, but on the other hand, on a broader scale, some interesting best practices. Uh, folks on this panel have alluded to looking at new incentives. Uh, one of the interesting insights that came from this 10 case study effort was there it is a challenge trying to find uh, new approaches to revenue and trying to counter that traditional rate recovery model. Uh, Central Hudson really did pose an interesting example where they developed a compensation model where the benefits were shared and split between the utility and the customers so that both were incentivized to perform. So the risk was kind of more socialized. There is more of a risk intent going to an alternative from a traditional solution, but when you have that set up where both the company and the customers are accountable, that uh, kind of helps to share the risk as well. And the way this one was set up was 70% of the benefits went back to the customers, 30% went back to Central Hudson. Uh, and it does show that we can continue to find ways to be able to design these programs uh, and can continue to look for new alternatives to that rate recovery model. Okay, great. So uh, let's turn to uh, the questions. And so uh, we've been we've been blessed by not quite a number of questions. So uh, we've tried to group them and and answer as many as we can. But uh, to the degree to which uh, we can answer them on this call, we will try to get back to you directly. So the first question actually is about New York. It's a specific question. Apart from BQDM, how many NWSs are underway in New York State? And so there are eight projects currently underway, uh, totaling over uh, 75 megawatts, and there are 50 projects in the RFP process now statewide, totaling nearly 300 megawatts. So, um, so uh, first question I'll just throw out here to whoever wants to answer it on the on the panel is uh, we've talked about no regrets approach, where utilities are at least neutral, if not welcoming of cost-effective investments in NWS. Can you highlight the few few key elements that might need to be in place before a jurisdiction can get to that place? I, I, I can give a first uh, answer to that. I think um, you know some of the most recent states like Minnesota and Nevada 
have started that process and as a as a groundwork for what's coming next and thinking about the business model uh, portion of the NWS uh, framework, they have started with information. So what regulators have required utilities is to provide more detailed information of where are the grid needs uh, of the system and uh, um, you know what what specific uh, constraints are coming. So I think that a key portion of this is uh, is setting within the planning uh, processes of the utilities. Uh, we need to have uh, more information so that you know then we can plan upon what are the critical. Uh, projects that could be deferred with NWA solutions. Okay, so related to this is um, is the adv adv advocate community. So, how how involved are advocates uh, around the country about N NWS uh, in places? Well, both in terms of encouraging the process and also in places where utilities have been uh, not actively pursuing them. This is Jason. I, I could take a stab at that. I think particularly given the nature of non-wire solutions, which are so often directly related to customer-sided solutions, I think, Richard, as you said at the beginning, you know, we know DERs provide value to the customer, but there's this question in a non-wire solution of how those DERs can also provide value to the grid at the same time, again, so that the customer's benefit. You know, and as a result of this nature of non-wire solutions, it seems that advocate groups have been quite vocal. Oftentimes, they're getting involved in docketed proceedings in regards to, for instance, integrated distribution planning or other types of integrated grid planning measures. And so I think we've seen in you know, official proceedings, many groups, whether it's manufacturers associations or other customer-sided uh, resource uh, developers, uh, who, who, are, who are playing a role helping shape the development of uh, actual processes at the planning level. Okay, good. Uh, Brenda, here's a specific question for you because you mentioned demand response. So how, can you talk about how demand response programs fare against other technologies in NWS? Sure, absolutely. I think that it really does depend on what is going on in that service territory. Some of the challenges that some folks face when it came to demand response programs, uh, for one case study, it was not only one of their first forays into non-wires solutions, but it was also uh, that project specifically was kind of their initial effort into examining targeted use of energy efficiency and demand response. And so the challenges there are the custom recruitment and the lessons that those project managers shared were that you really need to know as much as possible about your service territory as you can, uh, because if you're looking to reduce constraints along a certain uh, feeder or certain area, uh, there were some issues where maybe that community that you're trying to get that load reduction from was maybe lower income and they actually just were not using that much load to begin with, so there wasn't much to reduce. So that's, that's a challenge that may come up there. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Central Hudson had a lot of success in being able to recruit, but they were folding in a lot of different types of technologies, uh, adding in generators and other uh, opportunities to be able to meet their targets. So it did seem like a more portfolio approach and really did help to be able to meet targets more so than kind of having that specific uh, intention to look at one program or a certain area and getting those customers to perform. Okay, I wanna to try to get to three more questions. So, so let's do kind of a lightning round here. So can we talk about, we touched on it briefly, but uh, does NWS, uh, how does, when we're dealing with utilities that are vertically integrated versus restructured and restructured markets, who wants to deal with that? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I can take a. Go ahead, Jason. Go for it. All right. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think it there's a lot of differences in in terms of you know how how we deal with these issues. So um, in vertically integrated markets, um, 
your your NWS is is not just competing against conventional um, solutions. It's also competing against uh-huh. your your generators and, and customer sided solutions. Um, so when you look at the avoided cost of uh, and and compare that to an NWS, you you have to consider both what's happening on the TMD system as well as um, on your generation side. In in deregulated markets, it's a little less complex where you know you're comparing directly the NWS with um, you know wire solution, and so you have a, a little less complexity in, in how you compare the two on the apples to apples basis, and um, the avoided costs between the two are um, a little easier to calculate. Okay, but in theory, uh, should still be a good idea in both in both kinds of markets, right? Okay, definitely. So definitely. I think I think there's just um, complexity issues in vertically integrated markets to sort through. Okay, so uh, I want to talk about uh, uh, two questions about the future. Uh, one question relates to the issue about forecasting. And uh, given there's there's all kinds of uncertainty in terms of low growth, including the possibility or the growth of net zero buildings. So uh, how do we think about uh, the processes of evaluating low growth? Is the right framework for planning probabilistic? Yeah, this is, this is Jason. I think that's oftentimes what's been used in load forecasting where you think about IRP planning and the different scenarios available, the evolution of planning processes in a more integrated way should also do some DER forecasting, things like what's going to go on with net zero buildings, what's going to go on with the electrification of vehicles, et cetera, et cetera, adoption of PV. So if you could kind of do probabilistic analysis of both load and DERs, you could ultimately end up with the optimal solution. So that's kind of you know, we need new tools to do that effectively, but that I think is where the market's going. Okay, last question. So let's talk about the frontier. So uh, one is a geographical frontier. So what can we say about NWS in other countries? Are we in the US lagging or leading? And the other frontier question is, uh, what about, uh, we talked briefly about about, uh, natural gas, but uh, what about uh, water and wastewater utilities? Is there this, is there, same, is there analogous application? I, I can comment briefly on Mahir. I know you showed in one of your slides uh, Australia. Uh, I cover extensively the U.S. market, um, and I try to have an eye on the rest of the world. And the only country that I saw being very intense into non-wire solutions was Australia, which has also a very programmatic uh, approach to NWS. But, but besides these two countries, I think uh, there's, there's, I didn't find many other activity in this sense. All right, what about anybody want to talk about uh, water, wastewater? In my, in my research, I, I, I cover as far as non-pipe solutions uh, in the gas sector, and we cover you know, a few in New York, but really, I, I yet have to hear about the water solutions. But it's, a, it's an interesting concept that applies to all utilities, I suppose, and where there's big infrastructure, but I haven't heard of any projects so far. Okay. All right, well, with that, I want to thank our, our panelists. I want to thank everybody for participating. And and NWS. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Thank you everyone. All. Thank you.